Hey guys, I wanted to invite you to a special event we're having from August 11th to the 13th in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. We're going to be talking about the future of the monetary system at a very historic venue too. We're going to have speakers like Mike Green, Lynn Alden, Pippa Malgram, Grant Williams, Dan Tapiero, Jeff Booth, and a variety of others. And maybe we'll even have a special guest as well. So uh, come join us. I'm really excited about it and uh, hope you're there. All right, welcome to Generational Arbitrage. I'm Tyler Neville. I'm sitting down with Russell Clark today, who is one of the best macro investors on the planet, in my opinion. Um, Russell has a macro lens that's unparalleled. He is an iconoclast in a lot of mainstream market narratives, uh, and he's actually lived in a bunch of countries, whereas most you know global macro people uh, just talk about it and pontificate about it. He's actually been there and done that. So, Russell, uh, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. For having me. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So can you just talk about uh, where you came from? You know, I started my career in finance in 2008 at KBW, which was like a niche finance broker that just covered, um, you know, just financial companies. And I saw the world implode shortly after. It was almost the version of my career was 2008, whereas you started in Japan in I think 1989, I believe. Can you talk about how that shaped your perspective on capital markets? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm not that old. Uh, so, so I'm from Australia, and then uh, I was uh, I went and did a high school exchange in Japan in '91, and a university okay. exchange in '94, which was like the top of the, the Japanese market. Um, and then from there, I did, I continued to study university, but I did various things like in Asia. So I was also in Hong Kong in 98 during the Asian financial crisis. And then when I eventually started working properly, uh, not just sort of itty bitty jobs, uh, I started working for UBS in Sydney at the top of the dot-com bubble. Um, and so I mean, all these different places I went often seemed to be the top uh, and then they'd go down. Uh, and, you know, and that I perhaps sort of shaped my views on, on certain things. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, and I guess the thing is I've lived in Australia, Japan, Hong Kong. So I've spent a lot of time in the States. Uh, uh, and of course, I've lived in the UK for a very long time now. Um, so I've seen a lot of different places. Um, and I guess I guess the thing things you're referring to, Tyler, is that um, one of the things when I started working, uh, in fund management, which is around 2002, uh, you, you know, you get all these people, you know, talking about how the markets worked, and then they wouldn't apply to Japan. Like, uh, so I'd go, well, you guys got the second biggest economy in the world, and everything you're saying applies everywhere but Japan. It seems like a strange way of thinking about things. Why can't you build a model that includes Japan into it and? Uh, no one ever bothered because they didn't need to. But I've always tried to like find things that don't make sense and then work out why they look like that and then work from there to see where people might be wrong or right about markets. And so can you go into more depth on the Japanese economy and why it's kind of divergent from everything we know? Because they kind of hit their big debt bubble peak way before everybody else, correct? Yeah, they did. You know, so you know the you know, famously the Nikkei topped out in in eighty nine uh, at the very end of eighty nine, um, and then the economy sort of went into stagflation a few years later in ninety four. Um, and you know, one of the things that it doesn't, it Japan's not really an outlier anymore. Uh, it was more a precursor, if that makes sense. Um, but you know, at the time, people had this belief that governments just spent money that would create inflation. Um, and if central banks put interest rates down very low, that would also create inflation. And what Japan showed was that just spending money or just cutting rates is not enough to create inflation. Um, and you know, and so that, that lesson has really come to the fore you know, after the financial crisis, uh, because at that time, you know, governments had large deficits and cut rates very low. And people got very bearish, particularly long-term bonds, because they assumed inflation would be very high. And yet the opposite, where the world actually looked a lot more like Japan, um, came through. And so you had some very fantastic uh, buying opportunities in, in bonds, especially long-end bonds, um, 
which really continued through to sort of early last year. And now we're in a period where you know long end bonds are sort of selling off a little bit, and the question is, you know, are we are we moving into a different world? Yeah, and and speaking of the different world, uh, in one of your notes, you kind of categorized markets in two different, um, I guess, secular trends. One was from World War II until 1980, which saw double-digit inflation, and it peaked out about 1980. And then onwards, we saw disinflation and bond yields falling. Can you talk about uh, your framework and how that kind of like leads into where you're thinking um, in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, so when you invited me to talk, uh, Tyler, I had, you know, had a look at uh, some of the stuff you sent to me and you accurately described the way I thought the Japan model worked, which is Japan, even though it had low interest rates, had large amounts of savings that would send overseas and they would come back. And then that would create lower Japanese bond yields, but actually would create higher bond yields uh, in the countries where they lost that capital from Japan. And that's what we used to see for a long time. So uh, Asia, emerging markets in the 2000s, US again in uh, the financial crisis, and then um, many more on the corporate side. And then we definitely saw that uh, feature in Europe, in the Euro crisis, and again in the mini EM crisis of 2015-16. We saw that dynamic play out. And ever since 2016, that dynamic has not held. Uh, has changed quite quite dramatically, um, and particularly during the uh, uh, the worst of the COVID crisis last year, we started to see bonds act very oddly. So in March of last year, JGV yields at the long end finished higher at the end of March than the beginning of March. Um, now, of course, there was a lot of stimulus coming down the pipe at that point, but on the flip side. The, there was no vaccine invented for, for COVID. Uh, no one had any idea on what sort of variants were going to be around. Uh, you could have no strong idea of, um, you know, what sort of uh, bankruptcies there could have been or whatever issues currency moves could have been. So it struck me as very odd that you had this move in, in bond yields uh, way before you had any sort of certainty in what uh, a, a, a very uncertain uh, uh uh, event. Uh, and, you know, that was for me a little bit mind blowing because I always got used to the idea of, okay, when things go wrong, buy bonds and you can't mm-hmm. go too wrong. Uh, quite and so so right. the, the, the dynamic you're talking about is essentially like giant pension funds in, in uh, Japan. They take their money from Japan. They send it abroad because their interest rates domestically are so low that pushes up financial asset values in other parts of the world. And this dynamic worked for years and years and years. Now, yeah, and something flipped in COVID where actually when they repatriate that capital, interest rates would go lower in Japan. And now that you saw the divergence was interest rates actually rose. Yeah. And so to be really honest, this sort of blew up my entire model for thinking about how the world worked. Uh, and so over the last year or so, I've been going back to the first principles of, of everything I looked at and re-examining it and trying to bring it into a, a picture, uh, that makes sense. Um, and the thing is that, you know, for most investors, you don't really have time to do that. Uh, this is a, there's this huge pressure of quarterly earnings, market movements, uh, underperformance, outperformance of index, um, and these sort of things. Um, but to me, the way I try and work is I think if you can get the raw fundamentals in place, you can then identify where markets are really wrong and then build, you know, take advantage of that. So 2016 for me was actually, when I go back and look at it, was the beginning of this change. And the obvious things in 2016 were Brexit and Trump, um, both very political, uh, very sort of political outcomes. And historically, I've never bothered with politics because usually politicians will promise one thing and you get the opposite. So Obama, uh, Obama uh, promised affordable health care. Health care premiums went to the roof, uh, you know, and 
you know, and you get you, you can do that for both left and right politicians. Normally, what they said or what happened was very, very different. Um, mm-hmm. Now, what? Uh, but what I think was very interesting in 2016 is if you understood the Japan model, um, where you have like big currency moves, you could look at where Japan had money put money into and see where it was leaving. And what normally had happened was you'd get a big devaluation. So uh, Brazil, for example, devalued by 60, 70% from 2011 through to today. Argentina mm-hmm. is still in the process of devaluing. Turkey in the process of devaluing. So what I'd look, you could look at where the money was hiding and which was overvalued, and then uh, you could make money from it. Korea, famously huge devaluations, both from 98 and 2008. Uh, again, Japan led. What was very unusual about 2016 is the Japanese took their money out of China because it was starting to devalue, but China never really did devalue. It actually mm. kept its currency very strong. Um, and actually, that was the beginning of when markets have started to act in a very unusual way. Uh, and I must say, at the time, I struggled with why didn't they devalue? What's, what's the downside of devaluing? You get better exports, all the problems are pushed onto foreigners because you're going to be exporting more cheaply. And if they've lent you money, they just take a 50% haircut. You protect your domestic investors. Why didn't they devalue? You know, it was so hard for me to understand because I am, uh, I'm probably, I'm older than you, Tyler. So, you know, we're all creatures of the, of the sort of uh, Margaret Thatcher, Reagan uh, revolution. And, you know, we are, we sort of implicitly assume governments will act to favor capital over labor. And when you devalue, what you are doing is favoring capital over labor, because basically you're reducing the costs, you're improving um, export competitiveness, and you're actually reducing the real wages of workers. Uh, so you know, devaluation, um, which has been the go-to policy for central banks for for decades now is one of anti-labor type policies. And actually, if you look at like the way the Fed does things, Fed, you know, asset speculation, no problem. You know, you know, 12 times sales for software companies, no problems. Ah, but if, you know, if workers are getting a four or 5% pay increase, and that might be a problem, we might have to do something about that. So since 1980, we've favored uh, capital over labor. And that makes a lot of sense to me. So it's deregulation, um, deregulation, breaking trade unions. But if I, if I take a specifically U.S. focus on it, and this is where I think it gets very interesting, is that, so and I know a little bit more about the U.K. than the U.S., but I'm pretty sure the U.S. followed the same pattern. So when Fat, Margaret Thatcher came in, she actively went out and courted Japanese automakers to sit up in the U.K., and the reason I think she did that was to break the union power of the UK auto workers, because Japanese automakers are famously ununionized. They have a very a different model, but the idea was, okay, if we get the Japanese in, we're going to break the unions domestically, which will give more power to the other corporates. Um, and so you also start to see more globalization. So you start to see not only did you get more imports, it was also po- possible for U.S. corporates then to go set up factories elsewhere. Now, they, in general, didn't set up factories in Japan. But in the second wave of globalization, set up factories in Korea, uh, in, you know, Thailand, Indonesia, China. Okay, so what I think made Japan very special was that in this globalization pro-capital era, it never actually got the FDI from overseas inwards. So there's never any money to come out, which is why we never saw the yen particularly get devalued like we saw in, in Korea or, or Southeast Asia. Um, mm-hmm. And it also served this very important political uh, aspect for, for, for the US government um, under Reagan. And so what that makes really, what I think is intriguing um, about that is, even though we remember the 80s as a Japanese bubble, it was a bubble driven by U.S. government policy, right? And then the 90s, 
the 90s was actually Japan, yen's got too expensive. You know, there's no money to be made in that. So the capital investors took their money from Japan, started to invest into you know, Southeast Asia, Korea, and also domestically back into the US economy as the software stocks start, you know, the tech, tech stocks start to take off. Um, and so the way I'm thinking about the world now is that, you know, the government choices, particularly US policy choices, not government's a strong word, I'm gonna say institutional framework is a big driver of where the big returns are. Uh, and so one of the mistakes I think I made in, in thinking was that capital flows create their own bull markets. And then when those capital flows left, uh, that would create its own bear market, um, which is sort of, and now I, what I'm thinking is it's changes in policy that create bull markets. So the Chinese bull market was created by the, the WTO, accepting China in as a trade partner, which allowed the US to make a, give them most favored nation for, for tariffs. So then you said that this huge world uh, country where you could get uh, imports and US corporates could go sell factories and sell there. And so, you know, I think a lot of the cycles now are political, which then I think coming back to your original question is if we look at the post-World War II period, um, we definitely had a political cycle that favored labor over capital. And that's why we saw more inflation. And what we've had since 1980 is one that favors capital over labor. And what that means is it's very hard to get inflation if, if the average worker is not seeing a pay increase, right? You know, mm -hmm. so you, you know, you can't go out and put up the price of, uh, you know, bread, you can't double the price of bread if workers haven't seen a, a, a pay increase for like a decade. It's just because they no one's going to buy it, buy it. The point we're at in American society right now is as the inflation in specifically food, which you've changed my entire viewpoint on macro with just the food thing. I've been watching it like literally every single day as it kind of just grinds higher and no one in, in financial markets really pays attention to it because the brokers don't get paid in commissions to, you know, financial, you know, by buying food, really. You see data on valuations and all this other crap, but no one really pays attention to food, which is why I thought it was so like divergent that you do. Um, can you go into depth about the wages? Because there's a real interesting thing. You said, uh, looking at the, in the U.S., the federal minimum wage rose over 13 times from 1938 to 1979. And then 1980s onward, kind of barely budged, which shows that dichotomy of, you know, labor to capital, then capital to, to or I mean, vice versa, capital, labor, labor to capital. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, it's probably the most uh, sort of indicative uh, change in the political makeup of the states. Um, and, you know, and as I've realized that uh, particularly U.S. politics was a bit of a gap, knowledge gap for me and the history of U.S. politics, I'm very interested in politics, but as I said earlier, I never thought that it had a big um, implication for stock returns. Uh, and so one of the things I've been doing is reading uh, a biography on FDR, okay? Mm -hmm. Who is probably the closest, you know, I know it's it's common to call Obama a socialist, but you know, he's not really, <laughs> he's definitely not FDR level of uh, socialist thinking. Um, and so I was just reading about FDR and what I found amazing uh, about him and about his policies was that broadly speaking, his policies were, were welcomed by the business community when he was first elected. So in his first hundred days. So when FDR got elected, he went to talk to uh, American Business Society. And I was under the impression, I, I know uh, when I was reading, reading up and researching uh, minimum wages in the US, one of the things that uh, I read about was that business was almost violently opposed to minimum wages and the idea of minimum wages. That's what I read, and that's from Wikipedia. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. When I read this uh, biography on FDR, in fact, what was interesting is he went to businessmen was, uh, during the Great Depression and said, look, I know why you guys are suffering. You have all these smaller firms 
they keep underkind each other. Everyone's underkind each other, pushing down pay, pay prices, pushing down wages. And we can't have this anymore. So the government is going to come in and we're going to make cartels in every industry to push prices up. Uh, and in particular, one of the things which, uh, have you ever read of, of uh, that, of, uh, of Mice and Men? Yeah, yeah no, of course. Of Men. Do you remember the yeah. scene where they, they're like destroying the food even though all the people are hungry. Yeah, yeah. That, the devil uh, FDR, Yeah, that was an FDR policy. Interesting. He wanted yeah. to get farm prices up so farmers could have money. And he knew that you know, if you had to destroy food, it would be bad, but it was unavoidable. But he instituted this idea of making cartels in the US so that you could have pricing power. And that the more pricing power corporates had, the more they could raise wages. And so that idea is what fed through into post-World War II, 50s, 60s, strong unions, and through into the eventual 70s, where this, this uh, ever-rising prices create this stagflationary environment because corporates didn't have enough capital to invest and various things. And then we had the turn, which was a Thatcher-Reagan turn, uh, where we went back to um, much more free, free markets. I mean, the issue now, of course, is that you have wealthy people have way, way of loads and loads of money. Uh, and the very, very wealthy uh, seem almost untouchable. Uh, and it's also very hard to understand the very low tax bills of super large corporates. Um, yeah, relative to other that's, that's one thing I've, I've talked about ad nauseum where you know, the bigger your balance sheet is, the more debt, you know, if there's never a cleansing of the system, you really just create those, those Ponzi scheme like effects of debt for equity swaps essentially. And it's a never ending cycle for the, the capital class. But I think um, there's something politically changing in the U S where I, I think that FDR thing really is the key to what the Biden administration is kind of thinking about too. Well, I, th I think the key is going to be, you know, the, so the more I've been reading about the sort of political structure, and like I said, it was a, a hole in my thinking, the more I've understood that uh, uh, U.S. equity markets are being completely rational. So, you know, as someone who you know, started in the dot-com bubble, you know, one of the lessons you learn from the dot-com bubble is you never buy a stock on 10 times sales because they've got a good chance of falling by 70 to 80 percent. Uh, but actually, in this cycle, the converse has been true. You see a stock on 10 times sales, you probably should buy it because it's probably going to go to 20. Um, and I know, you know, listening and you know, reading a lot of other sort of big macro guys, often they call out a bubble. Uh, whereas when I've been reading a little bit more about uh, the politics, actually, I think it's, it's not it's not a bubble at all, it's rational behavior. Uh, and I'll give you, I'll just explain it very quickly and, and then we'll move on. But yeah. one of these ideas of favoring capital over labor was that also in the 80s is the way antitrust in the US was enforced changed. So prior to 1980, uh, the antitrust guys would go, what's your market share? They go, if you said your market share was anything over 30%, they wouldn't let you do any transactions. Okay. Hmm. Zero. And a guy called, yeah, well, you know, they look <laughs> at it very high closely. Uh, and then a guy called Bork wrote a very big, famous note saying, we shouldn't worry about big companies as long as prices to consumers stay low. Mm -hmm. So what he was saying is only, antitrust is only a problem if the prices start going up. And so what is interesting is you take a company like Amazon. Amazon has dominant market share in everything it does. But because it's always keeping prices low, it's never been really threatened with breakup or regulation or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what Amazon and also Facebook sort of pioneered is this idea that as long as you don't make money or don't charge customers, corporates are different, customers, any money, anything, the regulators will let you build a monopoly. All right. And so what you've seen is this very rational behavior is that Investors, VC investors, particularly VC investors, go around looking for companies that could become monopolies. 
give them loads and loads of money, build up their market cap so they can then acquire everyone else or spend whatever they need to. Uh, and they just have to make sure they don't raise prices to avoid investigation by antitrust, which is why you end up with like, you know, these loss making software companies on 20 times sales. <laughs> because the implication is not that they'll always turn into a monopoly, but they may well get bought. So Slack being bought by CRM. Um, oh, folk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Salesforce um, is a good example of that. Slack never made any money. To me, it looked like Teams was going to eat its lunch. But then Salesforce came and bought it at, I think, 25 times sales, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could either think, oh, that's crazy, or B, it's rational. I think it's rational. So what makes a very interesting title, and you know, for me, uh, I always like thinking about where, where things could go wrong, where people could lose a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. where, where is that? Where is the market mispriced? And so if, when, it's when I look at what's changing in the thinking about antitrust and the politics of antitrust, it does imply that venture capital and this model of finding future monopolies and building them up could suddenly fall off a cliff because the, the winds are changing because it's a, it's a binary outcome, right? It's like if suddenly the NH, it becomes clear, for example, that Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple are not allowed to buy any more companies and ditto Salesforce. Okay. You, you can't buy these companies. They, they have to grow into competition for you. It changes the whole dynamic on pricing. It changes the whole dynamic on future market share. It also gets rid of, because a lot of these companies are run by guys, I think, who don't have real exit strategies other than selling out at good multiples. Because I used to mm -hmm. see companies like this back in the day uh, where they wouldn't make any money, but they would make taking market share and hope to get bought. And typically what would happen was you have a recession and those guys would go to zero because they've got nothing behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, these, now they're just uh, hanging around, hanging around. And it also explains why, you know, Tesla has such a huge market share, a uh, huge market cap, because it's implying that it's going to have a monopoly hold on uh, software and other things like that, which is rational. It, 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 but if the winds of change are blowing, what you should start to see, uh, if you followed the logic of everything we've been talking about, is that if governments are looking to ri raise wages and reduce the power of corporates, and reduce income inequality, what you should see is growth stocks starting to underperform value stocks or cyclical. We've seen that, yeah. We're starting to see it. I don't know if it's 100% committed. Uh, and what you should also see is bond yields start going higher as they track higher and higher wages. Um, mm -hmm. And with none of that's conclusive, but it's beginning to happen. Yeah, that that is super fascinating. The uh, it, it's it almost seems like Peter Thiel called this the twenty first century uh, economy now, which goes to say, like you said, this maybe not this might not be a bubble where a secular stagnation is actually bullish for asset prices, um, and it creates that like M and A effect of you know the giant monopolies continuously buying those like new non-profitable ideas at ridiculous premiums. And the only thing that really switches that, uh, that capital, uh, I guess, accumulation is labor wages and food prices. Correct. That's so, sort of like... so what I'm, you know, what I'm seeing is that in 2016, China could have devalued. 2016, it was beginning to devalue. It could have mm -hmm. devalued a lot more if it chose. And what they decided to do was they raised interest rates. But what they also did is they came in and by government dictat, consolidated the industries that needed to be consolidated and they spent the money that needed to be done. And they also introduced capital controls, which has not been widely used since really the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. Since we all moved to Vietnam. Every country that's historically tried to use it has done very poorly. And so that for me was a big change. And so why, what I find interesting about that is that the implication is China's gonna favor labor over capital, right? Mm. And so what's very interesting is if the, 
the you can see the derating that's happened to Alibaba. Alibaba back in 2017 traded 12 times sales. Now it trades at four times sales. Uh -huh. So they're bringing up their middle class. Yeah, I also, I mean, and to be, to be fair, I mean, I'd understand the States, right? Almost everyone in the U.S., either themselves or their parents, moved to the U.S. to escape control by an unelected official that could never be changed. And yet you have Mark Zuckerberg seen there only all your social media life forever and no one's doing anything about it, right? Yeah. Google owns all your city. No one's doing anything about it. Uh, yeah. And they don't even bother to pay tax. I mean, yeah. maybe if I pay tax, it'd be acceptable. It, you know, it just, it strikes me as very, the system now is not stable. And, you know, when, when I'm talking with people about it, if you look at the way elections are going, in the US and the UK. I like looking at US and UK because they have a different electoral system, which is very confrontational, right? So it tends to be more clear what's going on. So even though both try, uh, Trump and Biden won by relatively small margins, the swing voter was all in that rust belt in the Midwest, which has historically been a pro-union area, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the UK now, the swing voter is all up in the north, uh, again, in the sort of Rust Belt areas, which is, you know, people who, who have not won from the system for like a long time and won't change. And so it feels like it's happening, right? Uh, the issue, of course, is timing and other things. But it, if, if it's true, so I don't think the market believes it in many ways. So you talk about food inflation. So what you're starting to see is the food, you're right, food prices continue to go higher. Food-related equities are derating um, hmm. because of the, so they're not rising as quickly as the earnings are rising. Yeah, I think it's because historically in the last 40 years, everyone who's bet on food inflation has gone out of business. Hmm. Right? It's, it's yeah. very cyclical. Uh, and so it's not, uh, it's, yeah. You know, so I think, it's going to, you know, for me though, it, it's striking for me is if you look at the level of food prices in the, in the US, so you can go to the CRB food index. Um, it's at levels you saw in 2007 and 2011. Both those times was a very weak dollar, right? And Brazilian Riai, Brazil's like the agricultural swing is the Saudi Arabia of food. Brazilian mm -hmm. Riai was also very strong at those times. It's now super weak and yet food prices are up there. So the implication for me is that if this, if this way I'm thinking is correct, food prices keep going, yields keep selling off and you start to see a derating and a potentially bigger problems in the sort of VC area where suddenly people who have all these unicorns that are growing really fast, but don't make any money suddenly suddenly everyone goes oh actually there's no exit strategy how do i get out you know, actually there's no exit strategy to sell can we actually sell the stuff for the profit and they're like <laughs> and then that's when maybe something happens but that, that is you know that is so what's uncomfortable about this is a it includes a political angle which can change from week to week mm -hmm. and b you're talking about like a big 40 year or 40 year time frame change, which by nature makes it very uncomfortable because it's not something anyone's seen for so long. Uh, but the logic of it is quite compelling. I think. Yeah, this, this, not to toot your horn, but like when I heard you speak on Grant's podcast, uh, Grant Williams podcast, if you haven't, listen to that one. It's a real great precursor to this, but it really changed my viewpoint of, of the global macro system personally. Um, and makes a ton of sense as to where, like, if you're, you're thinking about this as a big game of risk where all, you know, the labor and the pricing power is, and, you know, like you said, with Brazil, they're producing the food and why their currency is not getting stronger. Um, and the dollar. So, so let me ask you about, the Fed now because they're buying, I think, 
it's something like 50% of the, the treasury, treasury issuance now. And if they do a taper, you're going to have potentially food prices rising, a supply of treasuries coming to market, causing interest rates to rise, you know, food prices, the cost of capital would be going up, which causes like the abundance of, I guess, commodities to, to shrink a bit more. Um, it could cause like a, a, a knock on effect with all those inflationary pressures. Is that accurate or will it, so, will the debt powers, the, the deflationary powers kind of like overtake that? So, I mean, the thing is like, uh, you know, what, what we're seeing is governments can do whatever they want, uh, particularly when they act in concert, right? Which is something we also saw after World War II, uh, and, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, when they, the institutional framework changes, then um, they can get any outcome they want. It's just whether they want it or not. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, uh, and then I think monetary policy is secondary. I know we've all become used to central banks setting and doing a lot of things, but I think they just act in complement to whatever the prevailing environment is. Um, and so like Volcker was there to show the unions and labor that there was no money for the government to spend. Right. So you put rates up to 20%, there's no money. So then they agreed to the, to, to stop asking for pay increases. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually then the rates have gone lower and lower. I mean, the thing about the system, if you think about it, is that, uh, generally poor people don't save money by definition. That's why they're mm -hmm. poor. All right. They love to consume. So if you give them money, they go spend and you've seen it in the States, you see used car prices are going parabolic so many people who buy used cars have money. Normally someone buying a used car is not wealthy. Mm -hmm. Not always, like, yeah, it depends on how you define used cars. And we see, and the same with food, you know, now that you see people have money, people selling to poor people can raise prices and you know, they can, you know, they gain more growth. And actually it's a great growth model. Um, so I think, you know, the, if, if we start seeing higher wages as well, what you should see is that growth will be very, very strong, right? Wage uh, tax collections should be super strong because mm -hmm. it's much harder for an individual to avoid tax than the corporate, right? Um, and so then interest rates will be able to rise because government debt will actually be quite, uh, will be, you know, be supported. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of this strange dynamic because like, if you take this, so when we shifted from pro labor to pro capital, as rich people get more money, they tend to save more, which means there's more money in the system, which is more money to buy bonds. It's, and as long as they didn't raise prices, they both A, avoid the antitrust and B, avoid the Fed raising rates. So the whole system of equities doing better than commodities, let's say, was self-reinforcing in that system. Um, and in fact, the only thing that really caused the, the commodity uh, super cycle earlier, back in 2000, 2010, was China joining the system and their need for commodity being so large. But they were just like everyone else, you know, rich people got much richer than, than workers. Um, but I think China is definitely changing that system. It also explains uh, what they're doing in Hong Kong because they don't need rich people anymore. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, everything's changing. So what, what are the implications of that? Is that a reallocation under the hood? Like you said, like venture and the more illiquid stuff gets, gets hurt. Whereas in, in the long duration assets get kind of annihilated and then value kind of takes the reins as, you know, nominal growth picks up and, you know, commodity type companies and those who serve, I guess, the labor, labor growth, that, that will sort of pick up the, the next, I guess, upswing in the market. So, or does it all collapse with the, you know, yields rising and then you get risk parity funds just getting annihilated? 
Um, so I, what the way I'm thinking about, so, okay, the first, the big risk to this straight, this strategy, right? Uh, yeah. Which would tell you if you're wrong or it would tell me if I'm wrong is if China started to devalue its currency, which would mm. mean that they haven't changed. We're going back to the old system. Then you want to be like buying bonds like crazy and selling your uh, value stocks and actually just buy bonds because then it's going to be super deflationary. Mm. I, it doesn't look that way. I'll be honest with you. It doesn't look that way, but um, that'd be the risk. If we're continuing down this path, you know, what it would, you know, it suggests to me that, yeah, a lot of cyclical stocks are undervalued because a reason cyclical stocks got so cheap or I'm always cheaper than quality stocks is that cyclical stocks have trouble raising prices. They tend to be commodities, banks, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if average wages are rising like five, six percent a year, right, that is a five, six percent a year increase that a commodity producer can push through. Um, the other thing that I found intriguing is I tried to read what a Chinese economic planner would read to try and get an idea of how they think, right? And what I discovered intriguingly is that for a sort of leftish economic planner, they see overcapacity. Overcapacity is an evil that drives down wages. Okay. Mm. So when there's overcapacity, you then have consolidation and pri falling prices allows you to keep wages lower. So I found that amazing because when I go and look at, you know, you go look at like what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, what they found was uh, there was massive it, they had, the consolidation that was needed was huge because they built all these industries much bigger than needed. They just want mm -hmm. to keep building and building. Um, and what is interesting about that is back in 2016, when China stopped following the 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 path that everyone else had done, uh, was that they came out and cut capacity everywhere. And so intriguingly in China, China used to have export subsidies to promote production. They now have export taxes to reduce, to reduce production. So they're trying so to push like, wages high. It was sort of like the FDR thing, the devil's bushel, where it's almost killing off that extra barrel of wheat or oil or whatever it is. Yeah, but I mean, if you if you only think of it, if you stop, stop, stop thinking of inflation as this evil thing and think of inflation as wages, right? Then everything else falls into place and then the question you ask yourself is, what is the government attitude towards wages here? Do they want them to be competitive, right? So they devalue and they de-unionize and cut tariffs, or do they want them to be strong and growing, which is like a Trump-Biden view. So tariffs are good because um, mm -hmm. you know, protect the domestic industry. Government spending is good. Uh, buy American provisions are good. Infrastructure bills are good. Uh, and I'll be really honest, you know, from what I can read, this is a, that is a Democrat and a Republican policy, I think. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it looks part, like it's... Part of, the, um, part of the reason that I, I wanted to do this and call it generational arbitrage is, is a lot of the stuff that we're talking about really is, I think causing a squeeze on I'm 37 years old and just in, you know, having children and creating families in a lot of the, the millennials, Gen Zers are actually priced out of those types of things because the, the financial asset inflation has been so large and the wages yeah. have, haven't commensurately kept up with the financial asset inflation. And so you have this like almost like an oligarchy of, um, baby boomers or silent generation who've taken advantage of the capital appreciation and we haven't kept up with the wage inflation. So I think like personally, I've been trying to put the pieces together. It was like, why is my, why was my dad a teacher and he was a public employee and he, he could own like two to three houses if, if he levered them up and, you know, rented them out. And yet like me who was in financial markets was like, 
keeping above the inflation, but for the rest of my generation, it's a real, uh, they feel the squeeze. And I think a lot of that is shown in pop culture and it's kind of like morally devolving into some, not to get too political, but like some weird stuff. And I think that's why the politics that you talk about are probably coming back because you need to give uh, the populace a purpose or we're just going to completely split apart um, and, and create almost be like an emerging market where you have this like oligarchy. Yeah. And, and so that's all these things are, are the inputs into why we're kind of like at these polarized uh, political standstills. Um, so it really, it really helps a lot. Um, one thing that like Blockworks talks about and just to pivot into like uh, Bitcoin, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, I think that's been the, I call it like the middle class asset. Although it's volatile, people are looking for ways to keep up with the monetary dilution, like these ultra Keynesian policies that dilute your monetary base. Uh, and Bitcoin's been one of them. And I know in your latest note, you said like, you know, stock to flow. Can you talk about the stock to flow of Bitcoin versus stock to flow of gold and why that might not be the best model? Yeah. So look, you know, uh, Bitcoin's intriguing. It's impossible to value, which is, which is, you know, uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's obviously a liquidity driven asset of some, some degree. Um, and the model it, it, it builds is fascinating in that. So unlike gold, for example, uh, typically you do see gold production increase when gold prices go up. Um, but in my entire investing career, I've read a lot of gold bullish notes and they always finish the same. And they always have the same charts in them, which is they look at money, US money supply. And then, you know, they sort of, uh, you know, say, okay, you know, gold needs to rise to a level that matches US money supply, which is what it did in the seventies and has completely failed to do ever since, um, which is why you never meet a gold, gold bull. And so the thing about gold for me is that um, I've, I've looked at things like gold versus bread in the US it implies that bread prices should triple from here because, um, uh, you know, you can get very long term shots in that. Um, mm -hmm. I always wonder what exactly would happen in the States if bread prices tripled without wages tripling. And uh, it, I don't get I don't end up in a happy place when I think about that. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, but. One of the observations that I would make about gold, which you can also make about Bitcoin, is that it's nice to use this simple mythology of, okay, supply comes down, price must go up. But all assets are sort of, for me, trade relative to each other. So gold looks very expensive versus, or did look very expensive versus copper. And ultimately copper has performed better. Gold looks very expensive versus wheat, for example, for me. Mm -hmm. Um and intuitively, I like the idea of, of wheat and gold, you know, so your farmer grows wheat and then you might put some of the money he makes from wheat into gold for storing for the future. And so there should be a relationship. And again, on that one, even with the price moves we've seen in wheat, corn, uh, they still look very, very cheap on a long-term basis relative to those. And so with the Bitcoin one, what, what you find in like uh, some of the big bulls out there uh, so like Michael Saylor, uh, other people, you know, that associate with Bitcoin, they often use the stock flow model that this uh, plan B popularized on Twitter. So I thought, you know, let me have a look at this model. Uh, it's intriguing. It's very elegant. Um, and essentially, he takes the idea, you know, the more scarce an asset is using stock relative to the flow, uh, the more valuable it is. Now, the problem I have with that is it hasn't, you know, it, you can use it with gold, but like in every bull market I've ever looked at, um, so like Tokyo property, for example, you know, they're saying that they're not building any more Tokyo, central Tokyo property, hence the valuation can be wherever you want it to be. And you yeah. then had to suffer through a 40 year bear market and 90% lossy capital. So, you know, those types of analysis for me always, I, I think you should be very cautious on them. Um, and so, you know, when I look at Bitcoin, it's like, okay, it's got this sort of similar characteristics and it's interesting. Um, but 
it could be like gold, which disappointed for 20 years, you know, mm-hmm. and on the stock flow analysis from plan B, we're actually near the bottom end of where we should be in that uh, chart. And then if, for me, if it breaks below it, right, or in particular, if it reacts negatively to higher bond yields, right, then, you know, it's, it's maybe going to follow the gold model from, you know, 1980 to 2000, which broke a lot of investors' hearts. Interesting. Um, so we, we are at a very pivotal point for pretty much any financial asset uh, right now. It feels like it, right? I mean, it yeah. feels like it to me, but I, I don't know. It, it's, yeah, it does feel that way. Um, I think so. And one last question before we wrap up, but, you know, in this uh, cycle from essentially like giving bigger and bigger, bigger corporations, I guess, more access to capital to continuously grow, does how does that unwind? Is there like ways where you can split off and kind of break up these companies or is or will that become eventually inflationary because like you said they they the disinflationary pressures they haven't raised prices they actually created this like self-fulfilling you know disinflationary yeah. spiral if you spin them off is that another reason why you get kind of that inflation impulse or is it just wages that's like the primary driver in your opinion so i think the best thing to read is um so uh, Biden has nominated a, a lady called Lena Khan to be FTC commissioner, right? Mm. Um, and interesting, I went and looked at what the uh, FTC commission said about Facebook when they did a settlement a couple of years ago. And both the Republican and Democrat commissioners on that were like, hey, Congress, we need more powers to take these guys down. You know, we've, we've taken five, ten billion off Facebook because that's all we can do. We need more powers. And what's interesting is there's Lena Khan, who's been nominated by Biden, I don't see any reason why she won't get uh, approved, wrote uh, the, a note, a very interesting note called the paradox, the Amazon paradox, uh, the antitrust paradox of Amazon. Uh, and in it, she says, you know, Amazon, like I said before, use low prices to build market share. Investors have rewarded it because they can see it, it's going to have a monopoly well into the future. And so she suggests possible ways of dealing with Amazon. The first thing she says, of course, is it's better to stop a monopoly from forming than try and break one up after it's formed, which mm-hmm. is a real change in thinking. So it would imply preemptive action. So, for example, if new FTC would probably not have approved uh, Facebook's uh, acquisition of Instagram or WhatsApp, for example. Yeah. But with existing guys like Amazon, what they can do, for example, is ban them from selling goods on their own platform. So when you buy from Amazon, there's also Amazon produced goods. So they would ban you from Amazon from selling on that, which would be very intriguing because then would that also mean Amazon, if it buys MGM, for example, not be able to sell MGM movies via Amazon Prime, Huh? right? Yeah. That would also, would that mean that they wouldn't be able to host Netflix on uh, Amazon yeah. Cloud? Yeah. You know, so those are intriguing, you know, what would that mean? Because uh, it would imply that Amazon doesn't really make that much money now. Uh, and actually the roadmap for it to make you money would suddenly be closed, which would be intriguing um, yeah. to That's see if that happened. They also could change it so that Amazon has to offer exactly the same services to everyone. So it becomes a, a, a regulated platform, which also would destroy their advertising model. So when you search for something on Amazon, you can pay to be higher up the results. Uh, mm. And so, you know, you know, the issue with this view, which is a very bearish view, is unlike with FDR, FDR, when he got elected, had huge majorities in Congress and personally, right, to push through whatever he needed to do. You don't quite have that. Uh, you don't really have that in the States as yet. So mm. I think the real test would be if the midterm surprise and the Democrats do very well, because uh, the moment you got a filibuster, it's slowing everything up. But uh, it'll be intriguing because you know I think Biden's done a pretty good job in getting popular. Um, we'll yeah. see if the winds have changed. 
I, th- I think Kirill Sokolov talks about this, but he said something like, once you have kind of this fourth turning type uh, event, which is the Trump slash Biden election, yeah. those political powers tend to, tend to say in majority for like longer than you would expect. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking your framework is, is spot on from, from all those, but this was an absolute pleasure. Russell Um, gave me a lot to think about. And I I hope, you know, in six months we can revisit this if you have time, but uh, yeah, really appreciate this, man. My pleasure. It was uh, nice seeing you. Uh, You, You too. You too. Take care.